All right, guys, welcome back to Revive School. Here we are, lesson 22, 1 Corinthians 6. You know, <laughs> we've had a lot of Josh this week, haven't we? It's very entertaining. Kevin? I about lost it there. You about lost it a couple days ago. This is, this is pretty entertaining. But uh, here you have Josh, Sean, and me. And if you view it as everybody teaches differently and has a different perspective, same truth, but different perspective, we can all benefit from that. But remember, in, in really in the first four chapters, there's divisions in the church because they let the Joshes and the Shans and the Kyles say, that's their lane, I'm going to stay with them. That's their lane, I'm going to stay with them. But if we view everybody's coming together to actually experience growth in the field, this whole thing works. And so there's that transition of the chapters one through four talking about divisions. Now, chapters five, six, and seven really has to do with an overarching theme of sex. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. There's issues in sexual relations on how you handle it, okay? The very beginning of today's lesson in 1 Corinthians 6, we're going to take the angle of the lawsuits, and then we'll get into some more of the, the relationship side aspect as well. But just again, I want to give you a picture of Paul is writing to the Corinthian church. Why is he writing to the Corinthian church? Because they have issues. What are their issues? Primarily, they're functioning as babes in Christ. He's like, look, guys, I've already poured into you for 18 months. I've taught you everything I know. You should be on the meat and you're still drinking milk. And now because you're drinking milk, you're, you're combining the worldly things with your carnal, with your fleshly things. And now in 1 Corinthians 6, that, that seems to be the issue. The issue here is pretty straightforward. People don't know um, what you believe anymore based on your actions. And we have to have the, the understanding of our theme for all of, all of 1 Corinthians. It's a phrase called the last Adam. You know, and, and the last Adam comes from 1 Corinthians 15, 45, and it says, so it is written, the first man, Adam, okay, obviously Adam, Adam and Eve, became a living being. Well, they fell. Sin entered into the world. And then the last Adam came and redeemed the situation and became a life-giving spirit. What happens is it's, it's almost like the Corinthians are still in the first Adam stage. It's almost like they know what the last Adam did, but they're still functioning as if they're in this fallen world and they're okay with being in the carnal world, but praise God, he's given us life. Here's the deal. When you embrace the last Adam, you embrace the, the life-giving spirit, hence the nine hands, hence uh, the nine major gifts focused on love and the spirit of God breathes life into these gifts. When you understand that, the carnal, the flesh, is not an issue. But Paul's going to spend time in 1 Corinthians 6 writing, guys, I can't believe I'm still talking about these carnal fleshly issues. And so he says, okay, practically, here's why you need to consider changing it up. Well, first of all, it's pretty straightforward what Wearsby says is, look, you need to consider the lost. Like your actions truly impact those around you, specifically lost, the sinners, how they perceive who you are and your relationship with the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 1, it says this, If any of you has a legal dispute against another, do you dare go to court before the unrighteous and not before the saints? So, Kevin, what, what are we talking about here? Okay, if you and I have an issue, you and I have an, a, a disagreement, you're a believer in Christ, I'm a believer in Christ, and then all of a sudden we take it to Judge Judy. What's the scripture say? It says, why are you doing that? It shouldn't be... You should deal with it amongst yourselves. So we should go before the assembly, go before the elders, go before the deacons okay, of our church and say, hey, guys, we have an issue. We need to get this resolved. But instead, we're saying we can't do that. That doesn't work. We're ultimately saying, I don't really trust my fellow brothers and sisters. I'd rather go to an unrighteous, non-saved, uh, a natural man and say, could you give us, please, um, the ability to handle this situation? And then in verse two, it almost gets comical. So Kevin and I are believers. We can't get along. We're going to take this to an unsaved uh, person. Look at verse two. It says, or don't you know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest cases? In other words, Christians are truly going to walk alongside, assist Jesus Christ in judging the world in the millennial kingdom. And yet while we're here on earth, we can't figure out, um, you know, whose side of the fence post is our land. Whatever the argument is, it doesn't matter. Go to Revelation 2, 26 and 27, please. Revelation 2, 26 and 27 it says, The one who is victorious and keeps my works to the end, look at this, I will give him authority over the nations. 
Verse 27, and he will shepherd them with an iron scepter. He will shatter them like pottery, just as I have received this from my father. Kind of an interesting, you go back to verse 26. Look, the authority will be given over the nations. And yet, Kevin, you and I can't figure out, you know, whatever, whose side of the fence it is. Just one more, Revelation 3, 21. Revelation 3, 21, scripture says this. The victor says this, I will give him the right to sit with me on my throne, which is a pretty cool picture of authority. Just as I also won the victory and sat down with my father on his throne. You guys, we will be given the authority to walk with Christ and judge the world in the millennial kingdom. And we're trying to figure out lawsuits here on earth. You know, I love uh, Tony Evans, Pastor Tony Evans. Probably, in my opinion, one of the best preachers, teachers, truly in America. I mean, the guy is ridiculous. I remember when he came to Dallas Bible Church, he used to do a Wednesday morning Bible study. And I just sat there and soaked this up. And I was like, I can't believe a guy even knows all this stuff. <laughs> I can't believe he teaches this way. He knows the word so well that at Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship, okay, um, they have, I don't know if they have it this year. I haven't checked, I guess, in, you know, 2019. But uh, their church has court every week their church invites any believers, if they have an issue with somebody in their church, they can present it to their leadership and then they'll make the decision. You imagine if your church, and maybe your church does, I don't know. I mean, you can have people that can come to the elders, but I love the, 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 the mentality that, look, I got a beef with Kevin. Kevin, you and I, we got to go before somebody and take this up. Like, that's awesome. That's what we're talking about here. And I think for us, it's like, you, don't you know that we're going to judge the world? Like, we have the opportunity. And then in verse 3, it, don't just stop there. He says, don't you know that we'll judge angels? Not to mention ordinary matters? <laughs> Kevin, can you go to Revelation 19, 19, verse 20 as well? I mean, this whole phrase of judge, I mean, we're going to rule or govern. Uh, it's kind of a cool picture here. But Then I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and against his army. So everybody's coming together. But the beast was taken prisoner and along with the false prophet who had performed signs on his authority by which he deceived those who accepted the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. Both of them were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And so what you have is, is this image, Kevin, of, of Christ literally ruling over the enemy. Okay, now if you look in verse 19, here you're going to have the army is going to be coming alongside him. And so Christ and the army will literally have the, the authority to rule or to govern over, uh, I think it's a fair statement, the fallen ones, the fallen angels. It's a pretty cool picture of what we have been given and what we'll be able to do. And yet the reality, the reality is we can't get along here on earth. And it goes to this whole, there's divisions in chapters 1 through 4, and then we're talking about issues in 5 through 7. And then he continues on in verse 4. So if you have cases pertaining to this life, do you select those who have no standing in the church to judge? Okay, I don't know Judge Duty. I don't even know if she knows the Lord. But the point is, is do you go to a secular judge or do you go to somebody in the church that understands what we're supposed to base the truth on? Now, this is a really, truly difficult uh, manner here. But think about this. Most legally untrained believers who know the Word of God are far more competent than the most experienced unbeliever. I'll say it one more time. And you, maybe you could disagree and be like, well, man, there's people that are lost that have really wisdom. But according to the Word of God, most legally untrained believers who know the Word of God are far more competent than the most experienced unbeliever. I mean, I'd rather put my stock in somebody that has the Spirit of God knowing the truth than somebody that doesn't. Sounds harsh, but that is the reality. And he says in verse 5, he continues on and he says this, I say this to your shame. <laughs> Can it be that there is no one wise, no, there is not one wise person among you who is able to arbitrate between his brothers? The shame, meaning this conduct is suing a fellow believer. Like, it's kind of interesting. It's not only a sinful shame, but it's a complete failure within the church. It's a black mark on the church. Literally, that's what it looks like. Verse 6, it says, Instead, believer goes to court against believer, and that before unbelievers. Therefore, to have legal disputes against one another is already a moral failure for you. 
Why not rather be, why not rather put up with injustice? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you act unjustly and cheat and you do this to believers. All right, let, let's unpack verse eight. Uh, if we can, verse seven, actually, Kevin, it says, why not rather put up with injustice? Why not rather be cheated? So, Kevin, I steal your fence post on your land. Okay, you have two options. According to this, the scripture says put up with it. It might be better to be cheated and have to deal with injustice rather than go before a lost person and say we're not unified. Because that really reflects Christ. And that's really what Paul's after here. Paul's like, guys, grow up. You're so consumed with the money and the fence post, now you've lost testimony to who Christ is. Now, some of you are like, well, look, I'm a lawyer. Look, I have nothing against the legal system. Nothing against the legal system. Lawyers, judges, all that. I think God uses them very clearly. Okay, there's a structure that God uses. All I'm just saying is if it's a believer and a believer that can't get along, it's a really bad testimony for Christ. And in verse 8, it says, instead, you act unjustly and you cheat and you do this to believers. In other words, you're complaining about one thing, but oh, by the way, you're doing the same thing. When we go to court, please consider the loss before you file anything. I'm going to get to it here coming up, but, you know, in regards to divorce. You know, what a horrible illustration in a picture, <clears throat> aside from the biblical principles for getting a divorce. Okay, understand there are, perp- there are reasons that people are biblically allowed to get a divorce. Okay, I'm just saying, like, if it's just, you know... <clears throat> somebody, a husband and a wife, not getting along and they, they both claim to be believers and they come before a judge and say, we're getting a divorce. Kevin, what kind of testimony is that? <clears throat> All I want to just say is, is it, what, whatever the case is, if you're going to court, if it's a believer and a believer, please consider the loss before you file paperwork. Because you are a reflection of Christ. It is time that we go from the milk to the meat. The next point, it's the last point in verses 9 through 20, is consider the Lord. Okay, consider the loss. How does this impact the the, the loss? But now I want you to understand, I want you to consider the Lord. Now, I'm going to just tell you now, getting into verse 9 is like throwing a grenade uh, into an environment and it's going to explode. Somebody is ultimately going to be offended in verse 9. There's no questions. I'm just going to tell you what the Word of God says. I'm going to read what the Word of God says. And if you have issues with what the Word of God says, just know I didn't make it up. I'm actually serious because 1 Corinthians 6, 9, when I found out that I had uh, chapter 6, instantly I go, oh, I got the verse. Like, I got the verse that I have had so many conversations and discussions about with so many people in so many cities, I cannot count on my hands. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9, it says this, don't you know that the unjust will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. So here's what he's saying, okay? These are the people that will not receive God's kingdom. God's kingdom is talking about eternal life. And he says, don't be deceived. And then he begins to give a list. And he goes in nine and then he goes into verse 10. He gives a list of people that will not get eternal life. And it says, no sexually immoral people, idolaters, idolaters, every kind of homosexual, verse 10, no thieves, Greedy people, drunkards, verbal abusers, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God or God's kingdom. Now, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of categories (laughs) of people that will not enter into the pearly gates, that will not receive eternal life. That sounds really, really, really harsh. Kevin, there's a list in there that at some point, you and I might fit in for one season. Like, what if I'm greedy all of a sudden? Like, hey man, I'd really like this. For a whole week, I'm consumed with like being greedy. What if all of a sudden, like you have a problem with drinking and you you really are drunk? All of these scriptures say that if this is, and let me just say this, people who are characterized, okay? this This is an interesting statement by MacArthur. Whether you agree or not, I don't know. People who are characterized by their iniquities are not saved. Okay? People who are characterized, people who are labeled, let me put it a different way. If this is your lifestyle, the scripture says you are not saved. Well, that sounds 
way too forward. What happens is we read that and we read that as these are the unforgivable sins. Mm -hmm. And that's not what Paul's saying in right. this context. No. But he, he, here's, uh, no, not at all. Okay, L let me read a couple different quotes here. Again, I'm presenting to you what the word says, okay? Uh, MacArthur describes it this way. Believers uh, can't do or commit these sins. Okay, they do not characterize them as, um, as an unbroken life pattern. Like true believers who do see sin, they resent that sin and they seek to gain victory over it. If you live in this pattern of sin, ultimately, what are you saying about the cross? You're saying it doesn't matter. Ultimately, that's what you're saying. So let me just say something. I'll start off with, with verbal abusers. If your lifestyle is you're constantly verbally abusing people, according to the scripture, you're not going to inherit eternal life. If you steal, and that is your lifestyle, that's your pattern, according to this verse, you're not going to get eternal life. Let me give you a couple different idolaters. Those who worship any false god or follow any false religion, not getting in. Kind of crazy. Look, you can all disagree with me. I'm just reading verses 9 and 10. I'm giving you the definitions of these people. It's okay. Just listen. Adulterers, married people who indulge in sexual acts outside of their marriage. Now, can an adulterer, a person who has had an affair, okay, engaged in sexual relations with another married person, right, or at a point you were married, you can ask for forgiveness. You can come before the Lord and say, Lord, Please forgive me because what you've done on the cross, because you died and because you came back to life, you can seek forgiveness and not stay in that posture of being an adulterer. An adulterer to me is one who is constantly living in that pattern, in that lifestyle. I don't else know around this. Every kind of homosexual, like just in case you, you think there's just one, all anybody that's labeled homosexual, gay, lesbian, I don't know what else, I don't know there are kinds there are. But I'm just going to tell you, and you're like, look, Kyle, you can't be so forward. I'm not. This is what the Apostle Paul wrote. He says, every kind of homosexual will not inherit God's kingdom. That's not a message of hate, you guys. It's a message of love saying, look, this doesn't have to be your lifestyle. This is not how it was designed. Man and woman, they become one flesh. You cannot take man and man and become one flesh. You cannot take woman and woman and become one flesh. That's not how God designed it. But just so you know, I'm not picking on one people group. The scripture is pretty clear. It's no sexual immoral people. Like he gives a laundry list of people, like the thieves and the covetous. The, the, it's a, there's a basis of sin of greed. Like these desires is what well, you want something that somebody else has and you're constantly in that state. Here's what I'll say, though, in, in, in areas that I struggle with with all of this. Like, we'll all have our moments of sin. There's not one person that's listening to this is perfect. Not one person. And so as a result, what happens, Kevin, if you say something verbally wrong to somebody? You, you got to repent and turn away. I mean, it's again, it's a pattern. I mean, I don't know if you're ready to transition, but 11. Says. Absolutely. 11 clears it all up. He says, and some of you used to be like this. In other words, that is truly the natural man. That is truly the things of an unsaved person. You used to be like that. But now the scripture says, but you're, you're, but you're washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. You know what this says to me? All of those things that were listed before are signs of not being saved. And now the scripture says, if you are saved, if you've been washed, sanctified, and justified, those things are not a lifestyle. You cannot combine the natural and the spiritual. You can't just say, and that's what the Corinthians are doing. They have all of this debauchery. If you go to the little map here, all of this debauchery, all of this sin, all of this wretchedness, people are passing through, right? And it just becomes a haven of sin, a center of, uh, a center of sin. They're just trying to keep their old lifestyle and then combine Christ. And that's what we're doing in America. We're combining what feels good, what looks good and what you want. And yet you still want the eternal life. You just don't want to give up the old. 
I don't know, there's a couple ways of looking at this. The word wash means you've been spiritually cleansed by God through Christ. You've been sanctified, which means you're set apart as a people of God. You guys, the sanctification says you look different. Functioning as an adulterer, functioning as a drunkard, functioning as a homosexual, that makes you a part of the world. That doesn't make you different. doesn't make you set apart. And that's what Paul says. He goes, but look, you're different. And then he obviously he says you've been justified because of what Christ did on the cross. Folks, our sins, those things are kicked to the wayside. Do I fully grasp 9 and 10? All I can tell you is this, is that those things that are listed in 9 and 10 are not of God. And the scripture says you will not inherit the kingdom of God because if you fully embrace Christ, you would let those things go. Does it mean you won't be tempted with those things even though you're a follower of Christ? Absolutely not. If you're a follower of Christ, Satan is constantly going to say, hey, maybe you should continue in that homosexual lifestyle. Hey, maybe you should continue to drink on the side as a closet drinker. Hey, maybe you should consider having an affair. I think the point is, you guys, in all of this, is that Christ has cleansed you, He's washed you, He's sanctified, he, it's a sanctification process so that you don't go back. If you stay in that posture, you guys, according to Scripture, I wouldn't play games. In verse 12, it says this, and here's, here's a biggie, you guys. Everything is permissible for me, but, but not everything is helpful. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be brought under the control of anything. In other words, don't use liberty as an opportunity. In fact, go to Galatians 5.13 for me, will you please? Uh, Galatians 5.13 really is a summary of 1 Corinthians 6.12. And it says, for you are called to be free, brothers. Only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. In other words, please don't use the freedom as an opportunity to function. And that's what Paul's saying. You go to back to verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 6. He says, everything's permissible. But it doesn't mean it's helpful. It doesn't mean that it's going to encourage somebody else. It goes back to that whole stumbling block mentality. And so what, what should be our, I guess, what should be our heart in this? Like, how do we manage uh, this freedom? Like, how do we face this freedom that's coming at us every single day? You know, uh, Nelson's commentary comes up with five things. And I, I, th I found it really helpful because I think, first of all, I'm just going to write these down as we, as we wrap up here. Number one, we need to determine, determine your limits. Like, what can you actually handle? What is realistic? So like, oh man, like, okay, look, like I'm fasting from certain things. So let's just say that, okay? And that, you know, we were talking about eating. This happens to me all the time, okay? I'm fasting for certain things. And the next thing you know, on one meal, it's like, oh, now I can eat. Right? That's happening. Well, it doesn't matter on timing, but like know your limits before you jump into that. In, in any situation, it might not be helpful. Just know your limits. Determine your limits. What can you handle and what is realistic? And then I like this one, okay? As far as should I do this or should I not do this? Number two says, let time go by. I love it. It's kind of raining in the background. It's a cool, it's a cool sound. Let time go by before making decisions and commitments. So is everything permissible? Yeah, it could be, but give it some time before you actually say, let's do this. Like just sit on it for a second. So if you go back to verse 12, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is helpful. So Gage, is this going to be helpful if I jump in and do this? Determine your limits. Let time go before making decisions. Number three, this is kind of interesting. Pay attention, okay, to agreement or disagreement with family and friends. Like, okay, you could say, hey, look, I'm, let me just say, I, I love vehicles, something like that, whatever. Like, I'm, I'm going to buy this car, but you just bought one last week. Yeah, but I'm going to buy this one. So pay attention to people pouring into your life. It might be allowed, but it might not be helpful. Make sure you surround yourself with godly counsel, godly friends, godly family that can pour into you. Say, just because it says you can have it doesn't mean it's good. Determine your limits. Let time go before making decisions and commitments. Pay attention. What are other people saying? And then number four, this is kind of an interesting one. What are we willing to give up 
In other words, are we willing to take on new responsibilities, uh, it, allowing us that could set up problems for something else? So if we do this, what do I have to give up in order to get that? Again, it's a bigger picture. It might be permissible, but it might not be helpful. Yeah, there's freedom in Christ, but you guys, it doesn't mean you have to take on everything in order to do it. And then finally, this is kind of a fun one, and the last one, commit to giving away as well as <laughs> taking on. What are you, as you bring on things, again, what are you willing to give away? It's a simple little process, but I actually think if we slowed down before we jumped into everything that we did, we might actually say, you know, I don't know if this is necessarily helpful for the gospel. I don't know if this is necessarily helpful to advance the kingdom of God. We want the fields to experience quantity. <laughs> we want our families to mature. So please, when you read through 1 Corinthians 6, consider the lost and then consider the Lord. And then it goes on, Kevin, if you would, to verse 13. And the scripture just says this, hey, food for the stomach. There's a couple arguments here in the stomach for food, but God will do away with both of them. Uh, the body is not for sexual morality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. It literally is talking about food and sex. God raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Don't you know that your bodies are a part of Christ's body? In other words, as you jump into something, is it actually permissible? That's what he's talking about. If you jump into the situation, so should I take a part of Christ's body and make it part of a prostitute? Absolutely not. Don't you know that anyone joined to a prostitute is one body with her? For scripture says the two will become one flesh. And then in order to wrap it up, 17 through 20, but anybody joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So please slow down. Just because it's in front of you doesn't mean it's helpful. Just because you have freedom in Christ doesn't mean that you can do these sexual relations says in verse 18, run from sexual immorality. Every sin a person can commit is outside the body. On the contrary, one person, uh, the person who is sexually immoral, sins against his own body. And then it says, don't you know that your body is a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. There's a lot of freedom that we have as Christians, a lot. There's a lot of freedom, but it doesn't mean we can start walking into adulterous affairs. It doesn't mean that we can have relationships with prostitutes. It doesn't mean you can have relationships with homosexuals. It doesn't mean that you can now become a drunkard. It doesn't mean that you can become a, uh, an, idol an idolater. It doesn't mean that you can be a verbal abuser. That's what scripture is saying. He goes, that's all in the past. Your body though was bought with a price. Therefore, we should glorify God in everything that we do. So slow down and say what is helpful for the kingdom of God before you decide to do something for yourself. All right, guys, have a great day, and we'll talk to you tomorrow.